Safety Web Conference, Marketing Technology 101 for Privacy Officers, sponsored today by Wirewheel. My name is Dave Cohen. I'm the IAPT's Knowledge Manager, and I'll be your host for today's program. We'll be getting started with the presentation in just a minute, but before we do, I'd like to cover a few program details. Participating in today's web conference will automatically provide IAPT certified privacy professionals who are the named registrants with one IAPT CPE credit. Others who are listening in can apply for those credits through an easy to use online form on our website. We'd also like to remind you that today's program is being recorded and will be provided free to registered attendees approximately 48 hours following the live event. At that time, the slides will also be available to you in PDF form through a download presentation link just below the recording viewing window. We encourage you to ask questions at any time during this program by typing them into the Q&A field, the right of your PowerPoint window, and your questions will be answered either in line or during a designated question and answer period just after the presentation. Now on to our program, and I would like to introduce today's panelists. Andy Dale is General Counsel and Head of Strategic Partnerships at Alice, a good friend of uh, the IPP and mine, and it's great to have you on the program with us, Andy. Can you Tell us a little bit about your role over there at Alice and also um, maybe some of your previous posts. Hey, Dave. Thanks. Thanks uh, for having me. I'm happy to be here. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm the General Counsel and Head of Partnerships at Alice. Um, I've been at Alice almost nine months, and um, prior to that, I was the General Counsel and Head of uh, Data Privacy at a company called Session M that uh, was acquired by MasterCard in 2019. And prior to that, I was the, uh, the VP of Legal at an advertising tech company, and prior to that, I sat on the legal team at TD Ameritrade, uh, uh, working on commercial issues and privacy as well. And um, I'd like to be here and moderate. Thanks for having me, Dave. Excellent. Thanks so much. And as Andy just mentioned, he's going to moderate the panel today. And uh, joining Andy on the panel, uh, Camille Lando is Chief Marketing Officer over at Wirewheel. Camille, it's great to have you with us. Can you tell us about your role at Wirewheel and also your professional background? Thanks, Dave. Yeah. I lead marketing at Wirewheel, which is a privacy technology company uh, serving both uh, marketing, uh, marketing professionals as well as privacy professionals. Um, before Wirewheel, I was at a blockchain company, which introduced me to uh, technology around privacy as well as, of course, enforce the value of privacy. And um, prior, I worked in marketing uh, for B2B and B2C companies. Excellent. Thanks, Camille. That's fantastic. And it's good to have you with us today. And to round out our panel today, M.K. Gettler is head of marketing at Alice, uh, one of uh, a colleague of Andy's. And it's great to have you with us, M.K. Can you tell us a little bit about your role over there at Alice and also uh, how you got into the space, M.K.? Yeah, of course. Thank you so much for having me on today's webinar. Um, as uh, Dave said, I am the head of marketing at Alice. Um, that means I get to make Andy Dale a celebrity. If you haven't checked out Andy's series called Data Protection Breakfast Club, check it out. But in addition to that, I oversee all of our marketing efforts as well as our business development efforts. Before joining the team here at Alice about a year ago, I was the head of demand generation for another startup called BirdEye, where I oversaw both our marketing and demand generation efforts. Um, and even before finding my way to BirdEye, uh, I worked at HubSpot for about five years, where I worked in various roles across lots of different departments. Super excited uh, to have been part of that journey pre and post IPO with the team at HubSpot. Um, and I'm excited for today's conversation. Excellent. Well, um, it's going to be a great conversation. We're really looking forward to it. So without taking up any more time, uh, let's go ahead and get started. And for that, I'm going to turn the controls over to Andy. Andy, it's all yours. Thanks, Dave. Um, we're here to talk about marketing technology for, for privacy officers. <clears throat> this is a really interesting um, space because, in, in my view, marketing and advertising are responsible for many of the privacy uh, rules and regulations and underpin uh, much of current privacy law today. A lot of it started with the advertising and marketing world. And we've seen, over the years, increased regulation, as we know, the GDPR, CCPA, state laws, uh, and such all kind of converge uh, up and, and proliferate, and many of those, uh, those rules and laws have significant impact on, on the marketer's job. And so we're here to talk a little bit about that today. And um, the, first, the first image I chose here is, is the social dilemma. And I don't know if every, everybody has seen this, but it's a, sort of a documentary on Netflix it's drama, but rooted in truth. 
um, going deep into social networks and the way they utilize data for advertising purposes. And I just thought it was sort of emblematic of, of kind of where we are today in the world. Um, and a marketer has to balance all of the tools that they're going to deploy and utilize all of the data at their fingertips, but they more and more have to be really attentive to their brand and their brand's reputation. And the more and more uh, data they're utilizing and the ways in which they're utilizing that data is become subject to scrutiny, comes subject to privacy laws. And so that's required the marketer to work much more closely with the privacy and legal team in the past 10 years than they really ever have. And from the lawyer and the privacy, uh, privacy team side, it requires the lawyer to act much more as product counsel, in my experience. And that actually product counsel is a role that has emerged in, I'd say, the last 10 years that didn't really exist when I started practicing in-house. Um, and that's, that's now a thing. And <clears throat> in serving in that capacity um, is really, really, <clears throat> excuse me, an important role. Um, it, it may be in some ways the most important role that the in-house lawyer plays at a tech company, especially when you're in a smaller company. Your job is to balance <clears throat> the products and features that are being built and not be uh, constantly saying no or be a blocker. Um, and I think it's, it's become a critical relationship to establish between that, that lawyer and the marketer. And I'll talk a little bit more about that um, because I'm lucky enough to have my head of marketing on this call uh, today to talk through some of those things. And just by way of history to go back just, just a little bit, life used to be a lot simpler in the advertising and marketing in sort of privacy world. Um, advertising was driven by cookies. Um, and marketing was sort of more driven by outbound messaging, just marketing your business. Um, but, but both market forces and privacy regulation have forced those tactics to change. Um, uh, marketing in particular shifted uh, from an outbound sort of motion to an inbound motion. And MK can speak about this perfectly because she you know, came from HubSpot, which is uh, the innovator of inbound marketing. Um, and on the advertising side, we're seeing a lot of pressure on browser cookies. Traditional advertising technology um, leveraged browser cookies, um, device level data. Um, and now, um, interestingly, with all the privacy and regulation that we've seen, there's been a greater shift towards first party data. If cookies are third party data and device level data, first party data, data about an individual. And and, and so we've seen that shift take hold. Before I go on and talk a little bit about inbound data, maybe we want to do the poll and, and, we, and we can get a sense before we tee up uh, MK to talk. We want to get a sense from everybody, if you could, on your sort of level of marketing terms and jargon. Um, and that way we can tailor the Q&A in particular to do that. And so marketing moved towards more of an inbound motion, which is creating content, MK mentioned this, the, the show we created, but this also written content, the white papers, and, and, and uh, any sort of content designed to pull someone inbound into your organization. Um, and that took hold. And that, that requires the, the creation of content, obviously, but also the processing of a, a large amount of uh, first party data. And, um, and that means more personal information, more privacy challenges. Dave, how do we close the poll? Can we close it? Thanks. Hey. Uh, and I, I, I'm going to pass this on to MK. And I want uh, I wanted to highlight now that we have this new world that we're living in. Uh, how does the marketer then create a tech stack? And MK has a unique perspective on this, taking over the head of marketing role at Alice and having to to assess her tech stack and decide how she's going to build it, and we'll start there. Absolutely. Thanks, Andy, so much for the, the transition there. And I think um, to your point about inbound mar marketing versus outbound marketing, most marketers are going to find themselves in a position where they are either on the precipice of or already experiencing what I call tech flow. Um, now, again, this is more of an MKism than it is actually a standard terminology for the marketing field. But what I mean by tech load is that as we're trying to solve those core business problems, marketers are prone, they are want to add technology in as the solution. 
um, especially when marketers are trying to balance both their outbound marketing and inbound marketing uh, motions, it becomes clearly and very, very obvious that folks are using technology to help um, build better efficiency in their processes. And as the, tech, as the space has evolved, what's really interesting is that today, at this point in time, we have 8,000 solutions available. As marketers alone, this, is, this uh, visual that we're seeing here is actually the entire marketing technology landscape. And just in social media alone, there are 1,969 individual tools that a marketer can use to be able to grow their content distribution strategy through social media. Um, to Andy's point about the content creation for inbound marketing, 1,926 tools exist for content creators. Um, sales technology or sales enablement technology that marketers are starting to own more and more, 1,314 different tools. And as we even go down into ad tech, uh, 922, which means that underneath it all, marketers are trying to triangulate all of the respective data points for their customer journey across all of these solutions, which of course then opens up new opportunity and new fields for um, 1,258 different data tools for these platforms. Um, so as you look at a marketer's world today, all of these point solutions solve individual problems, but you still need one tool to rule them all. And being able to wrangle and maintain data and data accuracy is probably one of the the most difficult parts of any marketer's job today. Um, it makes the tools that they use the backbone of a company uh, and how well architected that data structure is um, will end up making or breaking how efficient or inefficient a marketer is. Um, I saw that uh, someone has asked about a few examples of the tools in these categories, but if we're looking at social media, you can think of Hootsuite has been around for quite some time. Sprout Social is another tool. Um, if you think about content, you think about content management systems, one of the most traditionally used one is WordPress, but I mentioned I'm a, a former HubSpot employee, but HubSpot would technically be considered both a content and now a sales tool. Um, they even have some ad tech in there. Um, so what, what's happening is now a lot of these, these uh, tools are starting to have feature creep where they're adding in new features, new functionality. Um, and or expanding into new categories. This makes a marketer's job really difficult to keep the data integrity and keep the footprint of their prospects and or customers as clean as possible. What I also think is interesting too is when you think about selecting the right technology and partnering with the members of your data compliance and your privacy teams, in-house, the underlying thing that you are trying to preserve is operational alignment and good data integrity and hygiene. When it comes into explicitly opting into your marketing initiatives and campaign, your marketing team needs to lean and rely very heavily on their legal and or compliance teams to make sure that they're following all the right protocols or following all the right procedures and that all 8,000 of the tools that I talked about in this slide are speaking to each other and have just the right amount of data integrity across these platforms. The visual that we're looking at here, this is actually how I've architected Alice's account-based programming, such that ICP, which is uh, an, another marketing jargon term, it's our ideal customer or client profile. Marketing's job that's featured here in yellow is to find that target account list and further qualify those accounts to be able to facilitate a conversation. And then we hand that over to business development. Um, and in the marketing organization here at Alice, we do have marketing and business development sitting under one organization. Um, but for many businesses, that's another organization, which means yet another pool of data and another group of folks using that data. Then we typically hand that on over to sales. In our uh, definition, we call them sales qualified accounts or sales qualified opportunities, which ideally our sales team is closing one. But as you think about now, marketers are stretching themselves across the entire customer life cycle. We are now not just only responsible for net new acquisition, we're responsible for retaining customers as well. 
So thinking about increasing the lifetime value of a customer and making sure you've kept your data, all your hygiene, all of your opt-in or regulations clean and tidy is becoming a really important part of what marketers are responsible for today. Um, with that said, um, I see Denise has asked a question um, looking at some of these cloud-based ads uh, complexity. And yeah, I, I think the, these cloud-based uh, tools do tend to add complexity in data protection efforts. Um, you could have an opt-in from a conversational tool like Intercom and or Drift. Um, where someone can use a chat feature on your website to communicate with you, and you'll need to have compliance and regulation around how folks are actually opting into receiving advanced communication from you and your organization. Um, with that said, um, fortunately, I have a very tight relationship with Andy, um, and Andy helps me keep checks and balances in place for when I am considering adding a new piece of technology to our B2B tech stack. Um, I've developed this repeatable routine with my team. If we ever feel as though the business problems we're identifying might require a new technology, um, I have them go through this process of first and foremost identifying and prioritizing the root problem of what we're trying to solve. And as I mentioned earlier, a lot of technologies are actually folding in features that their competitors might have um, and or actually allow them to have a competitive differentiation. So, so as you look at how you want to solve the root problem, your current tech stack could actually offer a solution. Your team may just not have known that yet. So partner with your marketers to make sure that your current technology, which you've ideally already vetted um, and have approved of, is actually folding in um, all that advanced usage. And then, of course, can one I, of the most hey, MJ, oh, yeah, go ahead, Andy. Can I, add, can I add something to that? I think I, uh, that you just made a really salient point that I want to add for the, the privacy folks and the lawyers here. That, that means that when MK and her team and, and the person like that in your organization, they come to you, I've found it's really helpful to talk through all of the potential use cases for a technology and to vet them all at once. You want to use this this way now, and you want to process personal information in this particular way. What else does this tool do? What are you going to use it for, and what are you going to use it for in the future when we scale? And if you start thinking about that early on, you've done that impact assessment in the right way at the right time, and you don't have to go back later. Instead, it's we're going to turn this feature on. So I just want to call that out, that that's so thinking um, scalably. Yeah, I love that. And that's the name of the game for marketers today is scale and efficiency. So wherever we can optimize that, um, the, the, the better our jobs become, the easier our jobs become. Um, and once you've been able to evaluate that current tech uh, stack, that technology that you have, and you have decided that introducing a new piece of technology to your tech stack is the right way to go, the key that so many folks skip over is having an implementation plan. Now, part of the implementation plan should be touching base with your legal and or compliance teams to make sure that the tool that you're using has met the standards of excellence that your organization has. But this also means that you're training people how to use the new tool so that inevitably there is going to be data input from a human somewhere along on the way but that as they add that information, they are adhering to the right procedures to make sure that we have refined the, the, um, the data integrity. And then, of course, like any good marketer, our job is to always analyze and optimize. These days, marketers are a lot more scientists than they are arts and crafts uh, and creatives. And so the analysis and optimization of uh, solving your problems and or introducing technology to help alleviate those problems is becoming the fourth and one of the most important steps in a modern day marketer's life. So these are the four steps we use to assess uh, B2B technology, um, but now you're going to need to understand how to actually apply that technology into a sound marketing strategy. So I'm going to kick it back on over to Andy um, and then have Andy help guide us to the next phase of today's presentation. Thanks, MK. Um, yeah, so now that you've built your tech stack, it's time for the marketing team to utilize it and look at its role and opportunity in the business. And MK talked a little bit about the tie between marketing and sales. In a SaaS business in particular, that can be a really tight-knit 
uh, organization, in MK's case, working with the chief revenue officer closely. Um, in other companies, it may function differently, but uh, once you've built your tech stack, there's a ton of opportunity for the marketer, um, and, and I want to let Kimi take that off. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, I, I love um, how clear MK is in describing um, the ways in which technology support the end goal. And I just want to resurface the end goal because it's going to help us think um, about partnership between, I would say, privacy and marketing. The end goal is customer lifetime value, which really boils down to how much value is our organization offering our consumer base um, and how much more value might we be able to offer and be rewarded for monetarily. That has to do with fit of product. It has to do with being able to serve customer needs ongoing, deep in that relationship, et cetera. So ultimately, it is about a trusting relationship in which, as an organization, we're able to offer value um, and, of course, maintain trust. And I say, of course, maintain trust, but as I'm going to show so in a couple of examples, that's not always the case. And I think that trust is the common language that um, can and should be shared between privacy and marketing. So I'm going to go into um, an example of a company that I do trust. Um, I, I, I don't want to put uh, a question around that. I want to say I do trust, despite the fact that look at um, the information that can be gathered um, from um, just my last order. And um, we don't quite have the chat function uh, for you to tell me what you can tell about me from this order, but think it to yourselves, and then I'll, I'll share some, some facts, some fun facts about me that could be extrapolated just from this uh, last Sunday's order from Instacart. Well, we can tell that I, uh, where I live, um, when I ordered, so one could extrapolate when I was home um, based on some of the cold things in the order. Um, one can see that uh, maybe I qualify as foodie. I was ordering from a market not so near me, uh, maybe for special reasons. Um, there's organic food in there. There's some um, possibly relatively unusual foods. Maybe I was making a special recipe. Um, and this is just uh, from one order, and in fact, just part of one order. Over time, we can see um, pretty simply, um, how many people might live at my house. Um, we might see some food ordered for a particular holiday, uh, Jewish in my case, and extrapolate that. Um, we might see that um, I have a food sensitivity or not, that I might be going on a diet. I mean, it's pretty extensive. Now, why do I feel comfortable about this? Because, um, and it's not that I actually read um, Instacart's privacy policy before I put in my order, although nerdily enough, I have read their privacy policy. It's because they earn this trust over time. There is huge value to me in, in, um, in this exchange. In fact, there's so much value that, and there's so much trust that I could imagine uh, deepening the relationship further. Um, as a consumer, I wouldn't mind if um, Instacart did offer to connect um, me to other sources of data or see other sources of data about me. Um, what if they uh, suggested a shopping list uh, based on uh, recipes I was looking on other sites or even some TV shows? Um, what if they invited me to offer a budget and um, possibly do some meal planning with them? Um, what if they offered some um, health uh, guidelines for some health goals I have? All of this is possible because of the trust, okay? Um, but now, as I go to another case, uh, what is not possible um, is me interacting right now with most of the solar companies um, that seem to be flooding the market with sometimes um, not so scrupulous ads, uh, to me, harassing phone calls, et cetera. I'm sure there are fantastic companies out there, but based on my personal experience so far, I've, I've blocked them out of my life, and maybe to my husband's chagrin, we will not be getting solar just based on I, I don't want to deal with companies that 
harass and mistreat my data uh, even before I enter uh, their funnel as a prospect. So um, we've talked about marketing technology. Um, also part of our conversation is the way in which um, marketers' job is shifting and in some extent becoming more complicated because of um, changing, um, changing opinions about third-party data um, and uh, changing takes from big players like uh, Google and, uh, and Apple in terms of how um, we mark an organization can connect its data to third-party data. What I wanted to stress and what I really hope hope I'm stressing in the Instacart example, is that there is so much opportunity for an organization to deepen its relationship with customers, prospects, and existing customers through first-party means. Again, the goal is um, increasing customer lifetime value um, through the increased value offered by the organization to its customers. And um, in this slide, I show um, technologies that uh, sometimes can get us in trouble. Uh, that's uh, in the slot in the uh, area called technology not used, and I I uh, counter it with technology one can use um, to maintain a healthy first party relationship. So customer research is critical, and customer research uh, can be done directly with our customers through a survey, through interviews. Typically, one learns much more um, than what the, from direct exchange with customers. Um, this is as opposed to um, relying on approximations from Facebook. Um, similarly, if, if a goal is, which it typically is, top of funnel leads, one can get direct customer referrals as opposed to working with list brokers. Um, you, you see that the spirit here is evaluating technology as to whether it helps our organization genuinely understand and serve the needs of our prospects and customers. The more we know our customers, the less reliance we'll have on third parties to essentially guess for us. And another take on what MK shared about the technology stack is a mature technology stack is one that helps us increase our ability to know and to serve our customers. So Wirewheel, as I mentioned up front, is the company I'm proud to lead marketing for. Um, we provide marketers with technology that helps manage trust, access, and consent. And we provide privacy officers with that technology as well as the technology to help manage uh, privacy operations internally. Um, we are uh, directly serving the needs of both marketers and privacy professionals and think about that connection um, through our product and our other efforts. I'm going to hand it back to Dave. Terrific. Thanks very much, Judy and Andy and MK. That's fantastic. Um, great uh, tee off for this conversation here. I want to remind everybody out in the audience that uh, we now have uh, some time for audience questions and, and answers so you can um, submit your questions in the little field that's just to the right of the slide window there, and we'll take them uh, anonymously. Um, just uh, for a little bit of clarification, I'm going to go back um, to you, MK, and your earlier part of the presentation when you showed that graphic with all those very many organizations involved in the space. And uh, someone wrote in and said, how many of these organizations appear and disappear any given year? how dynamic is this map, which is really kind of fascinating. Probably a lot of, probably rapid comings and goings, I would, I would think. So <laughs> what do you, how would you comment on that? 100%. Um, I think there's a couple of things to unpack in Denise's question. The first of which is that the marketing technology landscape that I showed at 8,000 is what it looks like this year. Last year, I think it was just north of 6,500 tools. And so in just a year, that amount of technology that has entered the space for marketers to be able to lean into has just completely changed how dynamic the map is and continues to grow and evolve. 
As far as a shelf life for any given one of these technologies, um, I don't have a, a silver bullet answer for how many of these may disappear or appear in any given year, but the considerations to think of as your marketing team may grow and or evolve is one of the things Andy pointed out, which is about scale. The problems your organization is solving may change, and the complexity of that problem may change, which would force them to reevaluate the technology they would introduce into their stack. You also may find that um, the technology landscape, as it does evolve, we find um, technology aggregators. Um, I mentioned Hootsuite as an example of this, but in a social media marketer's world, they would have to log into at least five different social media tools like LinkedIn, Facebook, um, the, uh, they could be advertising on TikTok even, uh, Twitter, and all these different platforms individually, they don't need you to log into them individually when you use an aggregator of sorts. Um, so you could have access to all those pieces of technology and also an aggregator on top of it and just realize that it's more efficient for your organization to scale those behaviors and outreach to those platforms. Um, there's also another consideration, too, is that when you have a new marketer join the team, especially in the more senior level of marketing, they may be more familiar with using a different technology suite. Um, I am a former HubSpotter, but now here at Alice, we use Marketo. Um, and so mm -hmm. uh, I could have said, I would like to introduce a new technology. I want to go back to using HubSpot instead of Marketo because I'm familiar with building a demand gen engine and a marketing team around that tool. But I would say um, you're going to consider, your marketing team is going to consider switching out technology, at least one or two core pieces of technology per year. To me, I'm not sure if you have any, any hot takes on that as well. No, I agree. I think that, um, first of all, everything's changing all the time. Um, so the smaller players get consumed um, by larger, or um, their features become uh, adopted by larger, um, or new features come up, which then uh, change the equation. <laughs> um, the, the thing to keep in mind, again, is what is the goal? If the goal is great customer experience, um, and how are we uh, working backwards from that goal and working towards that goal? What are the elements um, of customer relationship we would like towards that goal? Um, then the technology should plug in. Um, there was another question from the audience, which is how do we suggest that privacy professionals learn about the ad tech martech space? And I think um, when we see the, the map that MK that you shared, um, seems a little daunting. But I would say a couple things. One, um, don't, don't forget that you're experiencing um, this whole space as a consumer. And you have your own sense of uh, best practice just based on those experiences. And you could literally go to um, a best case example um, and work with your marketing professional to find out what, what technologies you think are, are going into it, and a worst case example, and, and also equally learn. Um, another thing you can do is uh, some of the bigger one ring to rule them all, uh, like HubSpot or Marketo, um, are really good sources to, uh, to read through. As in, go to their site and see what they offer, um, what picture they paint of an end-to-end -end, uh, technology stack, of course, using them, but you'll, you'll get a great sense of what's available. Some of them, like Marketo, have marketplaces with plugins, um, and, and that I found is the most current education as to what's available. That's terrific. Uh, thanks, Camille. Thanks, MK. You know, it strikes me that um, on this question, it's, it's got to be tough for folks considering new technological tools to bring into uh, the suite that it's uh, a balance between you don't want a fly by night operation that you spend some money on and, and you know train up on and get everybody used to that's no, not going to be around next year or the year after so there and maybe some advantages there with some companies that have been around for a little bit longer however the, the new um, fresh faces on the block often offer some real advantages and some opportunities these that are probably really attractive to people so it's got to be a tough balance um, between that so Kind of building off that question, let me let me take this next question and start uh, with you, Camille. Uh, and it's this: Would the discussion of integration uh, with privacy solutions 
be part of the discussion between legal and marketing when looking at new technologies. And, and the way I read that is when considering bringing on new technology, is there, uh, should there be or is there typically a, a joint conversation between marketing and legal about what tools to bring on and uh, whether they're going to be a good fit or not? That's a great question. Um, of course, the people on this call are likely to say there should be. Um, and maybe the people in the audience also will likely say there should be. Um, what we often see is that um, as re with respect to compliance, which our team um, sees as, dis as one level of trust, but not the ultimate, with respect to compliance, um, Wirewheel and, and other peers in the space offer quick solutions to get compliant. Um, to make sure that compliance is met, um, both from our consumer-facing um, uh, communications and also from um, our internal record keeping. So that's a first step. Um, but in terms of, and, and that we have seen um, a, a privacy professionals or legal team members simply adopt our software as an example. Uh, without consulting with marketing, but we see that as, as the beginning point because um, compliance ultimately uh, will be met by following the spirit of the law, not just the box checking. And the spirit of the law in the U.S. is moving more towards that of GDPR, which is, is there value for the consumer in this use of data? And in order to be able to respond to that, um, one needs to know, A, what data about the consumer is being used, and B, what value are we offering, in addition to how are we keeping track. Um, and so th those conversations would, would need to be not only between legal and marketing, but of course with IT as well, um, which is something that the deeper solutions support. Fantastic. Thanks, Kimi. Anybody else want to comment on this before we move on? Andy, did you want to uh, add anything here? Um, no, no, I think Camille covered it pretty well. I mean, if, if in general I'll say what I always say, which is the earlier you involve the legal and privacy person, the better. So if they're actually truly product counseling, then when you're evaluating tools, the evaluation of that tool comes with greater context and it's much easier. But getting Just handing them the agreement is too late because they're going to come back with all those questions anyway. <laughs> <laughs> right, and Andy, just following up on that, there is a question from the audience. You know, do you recommend that marketers have legal vet the service agreements with these online tools? I can guess what your answer is there, but you want to talk a little mm -hmm. bit about that and how important that might be? I mean, clearly I'm going to say that it's important that the lawyer review the contract, <laughs> but I think, I think you know, more, more importantly than that, it, it's that the lawyer or privacy person or both are in the room when the discussion is being had. You know, because it, that is more of a discussion than it is anything. There's a question in here about what's your process for when you bring on new cookies. Or, I mean, that also is just the same type of contextual conversation that needs to happen. And you need to be a partner. You need, to be a, you need, you need legal and privacy to be on the requirements list that the product team has when they're evaluating features. You need legal and privacy to be on the list of not necessarily approvals, but the list of people that MK is going to brainstorm with on which tools for which tactics to bring into the fold. Um, she just hired um, a new hire on her team, um, and he's going to be responsible for um, different different um, area of marketing for the business. And I, I think, I don't know this for a fact, but he just reached out to me to meet and I think that that's MK directed, right? Like one of the first people that you're going to need to meet is the lawyer and the privacy person because we're going to need to be, because MK is of that mindset um, of, of let's have that, let's have those conversations up front so that we can get it right now and scale. Fantastic. All right. Well, um, you know, something that has been um, a big force uh, within uh, the conversation that we're having today is the you know, recent enactment of the CCPA. Originally the CCPA, now the CPRA. And so we, we have a question here that I'm sure a lot of folks are struggling with out there, which is how much of an impact has this had on marketing technology? Um, you know, what about Virginia and Washington State privacy laws? They're, they're coming down the pike. Um, I think the, you know, the IP, just the Daily Dashboard the other day ran 
um, a little piece about the upcoming Virginia law. Andy, let's stay with you for a minute and just have you talk about that, um, you know, reflections on how things have changed with the passing of the CPRA and maybe a little crystal ball gazing on the upcoming state laws that, uh, that may actually come into play here as well and how that's going to affect uh, decision sure. making around tools and, and technologies here. Yeah. Sure. Um, you know, clearly the CCPA is, is of a big, big impact to everybody, not just marketing. Um, but in particular, you know, I'll just take it by example, you know, in joining Alice, one of the things on my plate always is to review our privacy policy in light of the CCPA and the CPRA and the GDPR, and, and does it need to be refreshed? And that was a project that we embarked on. MK and I did a lot of that together, and so much of that focuses on the, t the marketing tools, and as, as MK mentioned, the, the and both Kimi and MK mentioned this, the motion, the particular marketing motion that your company has put into play. And so it, it means that you have to do a holistic review of your, your practices. And I think a lot of people look at the GDPR and the CCPA as different in the sense that the GDPR has a lot of uh, and to me, and why we all know this deeply, lots of record keeping requirements <laughs> and, and a whole right. a whole slew of software solutions you know required to enable record keeping and back end compliance. And maybe the CCPA doesn't have that, but it has different issues in dealing with this really broad definition of do not sell. And so I think the answer, the simple answer is yes, it's had a huge impact on businesses, but if I want to go a level down and talk about how to practically solve these problems, a couple things come to mind. Technology is imperative, whether it's wire wheel or you know, another type of tool that you, you may want to use. Any sort of compliance documentation system is imperative. Having a person in the organization that owns that tool and can drive it, that can be legal privacy, that can be product. Um, in some cases, product, you can find privacy champions in your organization that, can, that are interested and will help you drive those tools. So technology is one. Um, there, you may need a cookie consent solution um, if you're, you know, for instance, marketing in Europe. And a lot of people are doing that in the United States as well. That can be, I think Wirewheel offers that too, but that can be OneTrust. That can be, you know, other companies offer these consent management tools that, that need to be evaluated and deployed. Um, so technology is, is a critical piece. The other piece is advisors and people. I mentioned having internal privacy champions. Number one, I would say start there. Identify all of the people in the organization that are critical, data science or understand the data mapping, where data is, where it's stored, what systems are being used. The CCPA and the GDPR require you to focus in this way, where those requirements weren't really there before. Um, so that's people, that's inside. And then the third thing is sort of outside consultants and legal counsel. And I just, you know, we all, you're always trying to build your own internal capabilities and build your team to have to do that as, as uh, to do that less, but there's extreme value when you deal with the, the complex issues. I don't need someone to tell me, well, you know, here's what the CCPA says. What I need to hear is from my outside counsel across my customer base, my client base. Here are the things that I'm seeing, and here are the things that you need to be particularly attentive to knowing your particular business profile. And that was incredibly valuable to us when we did our privacy policy. And I had to work with MK, and, and we worked with a specific outside counsel that knows our business really well and, and helped us sort through things because the CCPA and the CPRA isn't, isn't in force for a few years. We have no enforcement history for the CCPA to look at at the moment, right? So we're interpreting the law and we're putting it into practice as we go. Um, and so I don't know if I answered the question, Dave, so much as kind of just gave my thoughts on, on how to approach it. Yeah, but I, you no. know, I think at the end of the day, there's no one way. It's, uh, you need help to do it. Well, that's, that's helpful, Andy. And as a matter of fact, Andy, you just um, created a nice uh, segue into another great question that I was going to queue up uh, for you here that I think I'll start with MK. 
Um, you know, you mentioned uh, working with MK and working with marketing is a lot of what we're talking about here is uh, the legal department working with the marketing department. Clearly, you guys have a great working relationship. Some folks out there may be not starting off with a relationship and are thinking about building that. So, you know, let's, uh, again, MK, let's start here with you with this one, and then Camille, I'd love to get your thoughts as well. And the question is, as marketing tech is being evaluated, are there any tips or structures that keep the relationship between privacy counsel and marketing a partnership rather than adversarial? Uh, one could see how it could become adversarial, and that doesn't really help, so um, the relationship. Mm -hmm. So MK, let's start with you on that one. Yeah, I think the way that I look about uh, look at it too is uh, from a marketer's perspective, Andy kicked off this uh, discussion talking about um, you know the the, the new um, understanding of technology, and marketers are going to not understand the interworkings of the technology and the implications of the technology that they add to their stack. Um, when you look at the social dilemma. Lemma. Many of us as consumers are just kind of going along with the shifting tides in the landscape of technology and how that's evolved our consumption of content, how that's evolved the way that we get marketed and advertised too. And right now, marketers know that most of the technology and most of the tactics they're using to drive a strategy are table stakes, you know, digital advertising. It's table stakes stakes right now. What they don't understand, though, like I said, is the implication of using this kind of technology and the implication that that technology has on their compliance and regulatory issues. And so to have a symbiotic relationship between, you know, your legal and privacy teams and your marketing team starts first and foremost with education. Marketers are going to need your help being educated educated and on their social responsibility of managing the data and the data flow properly in the privacy of the contacts in their contact database. So start there. Um, never assume that a marketer understands why this type of information, why this type of regulation is so important. And educate. Andy has been such a huge value add to give me the insights and understand where he's coming at when he's solving the problems for our organization which makes me a better steward for helping to mitigate and or get out ahead of some of the issues he may have to uh, work through. Um, so educate, that's the first tip that I would have. And then reinforce in your own team. So just because I understand more of what Andy is trying to accomplish and help Alice accomplish, doesn't necessarily mean that the members of my team not understand and know this. And so Andy's Right. I had a new hire start this week, and one of the first folks I asked him to talk to is Andy so that he can also be educated and understand how he can be a better steward of our company's privacy and regulatory uh, needs. So once you can start from that place of educating and elevating, I think that is a really great solid foundation to build ongoing relationships and, and partnership between legal and marketing. That's Absolutely terrific. Um, Absolutely agree. Camille, yeah, would you like to add? Here? Yeah, um, what I would just want to echo is, yes, there are natural tensions in an organization, and if, if it feels like there could be confrontation of some form between legal and marketing, I would just say that it it's only needs to be temporary, um, to MK's point about education, because marketers really want to do the right thing. And um, the pressure we get is that we're we don't exist in a vacuum. Um, competitors may or may not be doing the right thing. Um, but in general, um, a marketing, marketing team is motivated by maintaining good relationships with customers and also with being allowed to do our job. Um, note to privacy professionals, marketers are maybe less familiar right now with um, managing third-party cookies, et cetera, and where we may or may not get into trouble or, or have frictions, but we are very familiar with the issue of um, email spam and um, when the, the case that many of us have been in where um, we send a, a blast email and then we're shut out of using systems because one of the emails uh, was marked as uh, uh, not one that we're not supposed to send to uh, for various reasons. And then our job um, is put on halt. That is something that nobody wants. 
we simply want to do our job. Um, and, and, and I think that's a good reference point um, to, that, that marketers already understand. Terrific. Thanks. Um, thanks for that, Camille. And, you know, Andy, over to you next. We have a couple of questions that have come in regarding um, consent. Uh, obviously, it's a tricky um, situation, and it's you know a case by case basis. Um, but there's a, there's been a lot of development in, in um, the requirements for consent over the past couple of years. How have you seen that evolving, Andy? And and uh, how does that come into the decision making process with regards to marketing effort and, and working with legal? It's tricky, Dave, because it depends on how you want to get consent and where and whether you actually need it. So I, right. I think it's. What are the questions like, that you ask in that evaluation? Like, what's the matrix yeah, of uh, decision making? Yeah, and yeah, I think it certainly jurisdiction matters, right? Am I in Europe? Am I in the United States? Am I is the action that I want to do with the data actually requiring consent, or can I take the position that I'm doing this in my legitimate business interest, as the GDPR illuminates? This is where I can't underscore enough having a network. Um, of other professionals and other people in your role to bounce stuff off, off of, not just outside counsel, I mean other lawyers, other privacy people, to bounce off them. What are you doing in this particular scenario? You know, do you think I need consent or, or can, I, um, can I use legitimate interest here? I have uh, privacy consultants that I tap, even as, as someone that, you know, purports to know what they're doing about these things. I don't know the answer to everything. This is such a dynamic world um, that that I don't know the answer to everything. So I think in assessing, you know, consent in general, it's sort of it depends. We had a question come up the other day about our inbound marketing efforts and what level of consent we need when someone downloads a white paper or wants to view a piece of content on our site. And I had to go through this sort of checklist analysis with, with the person about, um, well, what do we intend to do with the data? What is the way in which we could obtain consent? Um, and then how does that tie to further email communication with that person? I, irrespective of law or regulation, I kind of always take, I always try to put myself in the shoes of the data subject or the person receiving the email. If I receive an email, that is a marketing email directed at me, and I may not understand why I got it, or I may understand why I got it, um, but don't really want to receive it anymore. The bottom line at the end of the day is, are you as an organization availing that person of an opt-out? Even if you've obtained their consent to do something, is it very clear to them how to, how to have that activity stopped? And as an organization, it's our duty to honor that, that choice. Terrific, Andy. Um, we have just a little bit more time here, uh, unfortunately, because we have a lot of great questions that have come in. Uh, clearly, we're going to need to do a follow-up to this program uh, to handle some of those questions. But um, this next one, I, and what I'd like to finish on is um, what I bet a lot of people are also struggling with and wondering about how best to handle out there, which is, uh, you know, can we, in your example with the Instacart, how much can be, how much information uh -huh. can be gained about consumers out there with the technology? It's just incredible, yeah. and it's just rapidly uh, increasing. MK, as a as a marketer, um, how do you make decisions about um, whether uh, in in this privacy space? We say that there's this line of creepy where the organization knows more about me than I know about myself or knows more about me than I think they know about me. So how do you personalize to the extent that it's uh, beneficial to the consumer and that they are getting what they want and being contacted in the way they want, but not crossing that line where, um, you know, you're, you're sending a signal to the consumer that's like, whoa, I I didn't know you knew that about me. How do you deal with those questions inside uh, the organization? Uh, Andy just mentioned always putting yourselves in the shoes of the consumer, which is, of course, is a, or the data subject, which is great advice. But what are your other thoughts about that, about how, how best to use um, that information and build trust as opposed to, you know, scaring away your, your customers? Does that make sense, the question? Yeah, it definitely does. Um, and I think this, this ties back to what I was mentioning earlier about marketers being pulled further along into the customer journey. We used to only be responsible for building trust very quickly at the onset of the engagement so that our sales teams could close new business. But marketers are being pulled much further and deeper into the customer relationship 
relationship. Um, they are now responsible for things like customer marketing, where they are considering and thinking through the lifetime value of a customer and how can we get repeat or renewed business or expand that business um, and think about marketing strategies that help support that type of a growth effort. Um, when I think of, of this, this question uh, in the real world for me as a consumer, I think of Amazon. So Amazon is basically the backbone of our household, which I imagine it is for many folks who are on today's call. Um, but the way, it's the way that Amazon uses the data to further enhance and elevate the experience of interacting with them. Um, it's, for example, this year uh, during the holidays, it was easier for me to send gifts to my loved ones and family and friends by using their delivery service, and it was just easier. And so marketers need to really elevate themselves and think about the experience that they are providing with their marketing collateral. Um, product teams and or companies that are providing services are also going to be thinking about how they use this data to elevate that experience. Once you can elevate the experience and show folks that you are you not you know, misleading them, that you are building on that relationship and earning trust throughout that customer life cycle, people will then be more willing to give you more of that intel in exchange for that elevated experience. Amazon, going back to my example, knows so much about my life and my fiance's life because it's the backbone of our household, and we're very happy to give them those data points because they will continuously elevate the experience we have partnering with them. Um, so brands have the same, marketers have the same responsibility to earn that trust and never misuse the data that they have and always continually elevate the experience for the consumer. Right, it's a continuous trust uh, or continuous test. Um, is it what I want or not what I want as a, as a consumer? Am I getting messages and, and information that enhances that customer experience or detracts from it? Um, great, that makes a lot of great sense, MK. Thanks so much. And Camille, let's turn to you um, for the last word on this, too. I'm sure you have some thoughts here as well. It's, uh, it's tricky these days. There's so much power available to us, and how do we make those decisions about, uh, uh, again, how to keep, continue that positive, trustful, trusting um, customer relationship as opposed to stepping yeah, on the line? Well, and, it, uh, using too much data. So, yes, frankly, most companies, if they combine data um, with both algorithmic intelligence and human intelligence, could, quote, learn more about me than I know about myself. I think many companies are in that position. Um, to MK's point, it's what they do with that and what value they give. And what is most interesting to me about marketing's role lately is it's not and if we compare that, by the way, to what marketing's role was understood to be about 20 years ago, which could largely be equated with, with advertising, as in, oh, yeah, the marketing department will create that ad and will broadcast out what we think you need. Okay. Flash forward to now, where marketing is in the center of essentially data that lets us see uh, not only uh, how that message was resonating, but I think more interestingly, what um, customer needs may be unmet um, through a variety of sources. And that puts us into a product thinking mindset um, in addition to a communication mindset or a sales mindset um, or even a customer service mindset, other things that now marketing is doing. For me, the most interesting direction that marketing is going into is product, and it makes perfect sense to me because for me, marketing is markets, and markets are addressable groups of consumers or business needs that are currently undermet or frankly unmet. So um, just as I'm uh, delighted by what I'm getting from Instacart today, uh, when they come up with, you know, sort of automatic sending of groceries to me based on, you know, what, however that interaction goes, then um, I, my unmet need for even more time will be met. And that, you could think of that as a, a marketing contribution to the picture, a product contribution, um, or some combination. And, and I think that back to maybe wrapping up, the, the common theme for me and um, the common theme in what MK has been saying is that we are 
stewards of information, but ultimately the goal is, um, is for the sake of the consumer um, and for the value we can give to the consumer, which then, of course, translates to, to profitability, hopefully, for the organization and, and what we call customer lifetime value. Well, that's a perfect place to end, Camille. Thanks so much for that. And, um, you know, thank you, MK, for joining us on the panel and Andy for both contributing and, and moderating the conversation today. It was uh, fascinating. We had huge um, uh, response and audience and lots of you online here with us today. So uh, clearly a well-received topic, and, and I think you guys did a great job at delivering some useful information for folks. So thank you all very much for uh, joining us today. also wanted to provide a really hearty thank you to Why Are We for uh, sponsoring the program today for us here at the IETP, making this um, virtual education uh, free and available to all of you out there. So thank you, Wirewheel. It's partnerships that the IETP has with uh, um, you know, partners like you that uh, keep the privacy community uh, alive and thriving, especially in these challenging times. So I really wanted to send out a big um, thank you. That's a, if you're watching this uh, webinar live, that um, Why Are We a logo in the middle there is a live link and we'll take you to your home page if you'd like to learn more about them as an organization. And if you're still in line with us, uh, I'd love for you to click on the link in front of you on the slide and uh, take a very quick survey for us. It's, uh, we've timed it. It literally takes two minutes. Let's us know how we're doing here at the IPP with these privacy education web conferences. Um, and you know, did this program deliver what you expected it to? There's a field in the survey that allows you to tell us what topics and issues you'd like to hear about on future programs, which we look at regularly in order to program. So uh, please click the link in front of you there. Uh, go to that quick survey. Give us some feedback. Uh, let us know how we're doing and let us know what we can do to serve you well in the future. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the program, if you're an IEPP certified privacy pro, you have a certification with us, and you register through the website, we're going to automatically grant you one uh, CPE credit toward the upkeep of your certification. And if you're listening in and uh, you didn't register through the website, which of course is fine, uh, you can still get that credit by going to the certification tab on our site and filling out a real quick form, and we'll give you that credit. Uh, if you're an attorney and you're wondering about continuing legal education credits, um, that uh, they are available in a lot of jurisdictions, but we don't pre-certify these programs. So if you need further information about that, you can contact me. I'm dave at iapp.org. Shoot me a note, and I will um, do what I can to provide you with materials and information on that. So with that, uh, it was a wonderful program. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today, and hope to see you on another program in the near future. So with that, I'll take us to a program close.